Okay, this is the um, 36th lecture in a 41 lecture series. I'm sort of coming to the end um, about creating an international sustainable civilization. And it's right now, this section is on the prophets, the prophetic tradition, specifically it's on Islam and more specifically it's on how you can apply how Islam, how you have to make wisdoms, uh, judgments related to the art of deliberation, practical wisdom uh, since 9-11 in America, in the Mideast, in Indonesia. And this particular lecture is about Indonesia specifically, and it's mostly excerpts from the Jakarta Post while I was there. So again, it's just a tiny uh, fraction, a little piece of reality, but it each one of those pieces is part of a much broader pattern and tradition. And so I think these broader patterns are what give us hope. And there's a lot of reason for hope. And there's also the fact that if we don't keep working, things will definitely get worse because um, it's easy to give in to fear or self-indulgence for pleasure. It's difficult to stand back and to tr truly try to love wisdom and to make the best decision. But if you do that, then once the decision is made and you start experiencing the consequences, you can either learn from your mistake or learn from your successes. And you can develop a history of educating yourself. If you don't do that, life is just one thing after another. It's chaos. And you will more and more want to act by default, you will act on impulse and on fear, on pleasure and fear, because there's nothing left. You hadn't developed your mind enough, well enough, to sit back and really have a history of thoughtful, of living an examined life and having friends that do that and having a nation that does that and having a world that does that, that you can fall back on as a model when you come to the next decision. If you have no history to fall back on, how are you gonna really be able to deliberate well? Um, so here is number 37. Okay, so the first part are articles from the Jakarta Post. So I was in, um, I used to, I think this was, yeah, all right. Anyway, 2012, and then what I remember is when I was in Jogja, which most of the time I was in Bandung, I guess I didn't read the Jakarta Post. When I was in Indonesia, yeah, Jogja, I could walk to the shopping mall, which I don't particularly like shopping malls, but they had a Starbucks. And they had a Jakarta Post, and I could sit and drink my Starbucks and read my Jakarta Post. And I still, you know, like newspapers. Now I can read it online. Um, but I haven't been, partly because I need to be engaged. I need to figure out how I can make a difference wherever I am. And that hasn't been the priority right now. But when I was there, it was a priority. And also, these articles reflect overall trends, which are important to understand. So it's not always the immediate editorials that are the most important. All right. So it is interesting to see what changes and what stays the same in both the U.S. and in Indonesia. So in 2012, there was an editorial called Despots are nobody's dummies. Um, despots are not stupid. They have strategies for maintaining control. 
They observe the appearance of de democratic norms while at the same time subverting them, okay? And that's very important to realize. People don't walk around saying, I'm stupid, I'm evil. They have plans. They control the media that matter and they manipulate the laws. This is happening in spades now, right? This is really happening even more severely. So this editorial was very forward looking. I don't think the person who wrote it had any idea that 10 years later, this the whole world would be falling victim to despots, these kinds of despots. The author of this book, so the editorial is a book review, firmly believes that the force, this is incredible, that the forces of democracy are in the ascendance. The spread of information is making it harder for government to focus on, on power, chip, geez, chipping away, whoops, chipping away at an authority at authoritarianism. So uh, that's amazing because just 10 years ago, 12 years ago, the authors, educated people, they wrote about despots in order to make sure people who are building democracies keep an eye out for this, but they were ultimately um, optimistic. They thought democracies were spreading because of information. This was before social media. This was before Fox News or before Fox News really got a, got a handle on it and supported Trump. No one thought, no one, and as recently as 2012, thought authoritarianism would be rising as it is today. I myself was scared. And I told my kids I was so scared. And they were, uh, they thought I was crazy. And they thought I needed to stop being so anxious. I mean, it drove them nuts because they lived in Washington, D.C., Minnesota, and Los Angeles, which are totally blue places. But I was always scared because it was happening in my town. Um, but no one thought the United, the leader of the United States would be a leader, uh, would be authoritarian right, um, would be a leader in this rise of authoritarianism. Authoritarian leaders everywhere are now looking to the U.S. to find strategies for how to destroy democracies. Exactly the opposite of after World War II. People, we, Britain and Europe had passed the torch of democracy over to the U.S. We were going to to be the torch bearer, which is an image from uh, the Greeks. Hermes was the torch bearer, the light of democracy. And he got that flame from Hestia back at the hearth. Okay. So we were going to be the torch bearer. And now we're the torch bearer for how to lose a democracy because we had all the advantages and we are losing it. Basically, I think the first time we elected Trump, it shows that we lost it. The fact that it's even going to be a close election shows that we even lost it more than I had thought. And if we actually elect Trump, we will lose it even more. I don't, I really don't know. I think it will come back, but I don't know how long it will take for us to recover our democracy if we elect Trump in 2024. I really don't. Because I, the way people vote, why they vote, they don't think. It's, it's very impulsive. It's very immediate, driven by, as far as I can tell, fantasies and phobias. So I, and I will say that the way elections come out, because there's about 7% of the population that waits to decide how to vote right at the last minute. So those are the people who think, who have the least broader understanding. 
But the fact that people with a broader understanding have decided to identify with an authoritarian brand, which Republican Party is at this time, shows me that I don't think there's enough Americans that really care about democracy that even want it. I think they want some strong man who tells them he'll fix it and makes them feel good. A big daddy who solved their problems. If you want a democracy, you have to realize there's no big daddy who's going to solve it. People have to solve it by working together, by talking to each other. So I hope Indonesians can model that. And they need to know that Americans, um, many, many of them, at least half, don't want it. It's not easy. This is what Martin Luther King talked about Socrates, to maintain this creative tension. You always have to be telling people, are you sure? You have to examine, re-examine, re-examine, or you're not going to keep your democracy. Um, so I'm trying to reach out to others who might be able to learn how to preserve a democracy. And some of those people are at the UN schools in Indonesia. Losing and saving democracy today, 2024. Okay. All right. So no one ever thought this. I'm trying to reach out to other nations, letting them know why we're losing our democracy. So they avoid making these mistakes. In 2024, 50% of the world's people have elections this year. Now, India has already had its election. Modi has won, and he's consolidating his power. He's using Hinduism as a weapon. And Muslims, you know, are aware of that because they're the ones that are suffering at the hands of this weapon. Uh, but there was more of an opposition. His party did not win by as much. But who knows? That doesn't mean that it's, you know, peaked. Uh, <laughs> there's lots of ways that someone with that much power can make the conditions worse so that people will, people become so afraid and so unstable. They think a centralized power is better than decentralized because of how chaotic things are. Who knows? <laughs> the Fulbright program, that's how I first got into Indonesia. It asks everyone applying to show that they will be cultural ambassadors. This came from the time right after World War II when we represented the beacon of democracy to the world. We were ambassadors from our democracy to developing democracies. In my application, however, now, I call myself a cultural collaborator because I both teach and I learn from others how to lose and how to save democracy. My nation has the same problems as many other nations, maybe all other nations at this point. Okay. Here's the editorial from 2012. It was Panchasila Day. Indonesia has traveled a long way as an independent nation. And for much of that journey, Panchasila has been the track that's kept all the carriages heading in the right direction. This did not happen by chance, but through consistent application and affirmation of the principles that define the state ideology. Under Panchasila, no religion or ethnic group is held above the other. Unfortunately, they say, since the reform era, Panchasila has taken a back seat, allowing radical and extremist groups to come to the fore. If left unchecked, these groups will erode our nationalism and our harmony. All right. Well, you know, it's controversial. How did Mr. Sukarno apply Ponticilla, right? When he, he then at a certain point decided we have to stop elections for a while. Then there's Mr. Suharto who hid behind Ponticillo and 
was very authoritarian in uh, some ways. Um, he did other things like give money to the UN schools to um, teach Western thought. I mean, I wait, maybe it wasn't him that did that. He did some pretty enlightened things. I'd like to grant him something, but he really used Panchasila to engage in a lot of more authoritarian behaviors. Um, but that's up to Indonesians to decide, right? They know that each president had an agenda and used Panchasila to further their agenda. Some of them were much more faithful to the spirit of Panchasila than others. And then this journal article uh, tells the story in this particular way. It is thus critical that the government, as well as social and religious groups, reaffirm Panchasila as a national ideology. And so you can talk to each other about President um, starts with why, uh, what he did with Panchasila, and why it was, you know, that so many of his workers or his close people who he gave power to were uh, accused of corruption and arrested. Is that connected to Ponchasilla? Did he hide behind Ponchasilla when he did whatever these illegal activities were? Did he truly undermine? I mean, you know, you know that. I don't know. Um, was it the problem that people get discouraged and they just say all the governments, all they're all corrupt and that happens in our country. They're not all equally corrupt. And you should make sure you don't think that and you don't let your students think that. Because if you do, the most severe manipulative rhetoric will lead to people voting for the people who use it, and even a more extreme anti-democratic leader. So they are not all the same. You have to cut through the rhetoric, find out what's the history behind the people who support this candidate or the party? What's the history behind the party that supports this candidate? Who is this person going to appoint to exercise power? What's their history? What's their party history? Everyone who still elects their leaders needs to know that. They need to be informed and they need to inform each other. They need to talk to each other because there's lots of things that I don't know, but I do know a lot. And that's because I've been studying and reading and all that. But that doesn't mean Somebody doesn't know something I really need to know. I just read a book where I found out something I didn't know that I really needed to know to put the pieces in place. Um, so that's why Socrates says, every day we have to get up and examine our lives and ask what is justice, what is truth, what is beauty? Because it changes and because we never know. And you know, we never really know enough to have practical wisdom, and yet we still have to make decisions. So we have to make them based on what we do know and also what we don't know. And so we have to keep seeking more knowledge. Okay. Um, Unity and diversity. Here's another article. Uh, on June 2nd, Indonesian vice president quoted Martin Luther King. So I think that's amazing. And that's why my lecture on Martin Luther King, letter from a Birmingham jail. This is a quote from that. It's not that long a document. You could assign it in a class. Um, it depends upon what you've taught before and what you plan to teach, how effective that lesson will be, but it could be very effective. And this particular article could probably help you. Um, he quotes, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. And definitely it's true for every one of these countries that's falling into authoritarianism. 
They need a politician who says, we must learn to live together as brothers or we will perish. We will lose our democracy as fools. So when we polarize people we disagree with, it's foolish. It's foolish because we don't know what they know and we need to know it. And it's foolish because it will lead to authoritarianism. So even if you disagree, even if the people can't teach you something that would make your own position more nuanced, just to know how people think, just to think about how they think and how to work together to avoid polarization, avoid social instability and preserve democracy. Absolutely critical. So we have to live together as brothers. We have to reach out to each other. We have to find our common humanity. We have to set up conversations based on the assumption that if I grew up in that situation, I would have that opinion. So I can identify with that person. And um, that's how you save a democracy. And Indonesian vice president understands it just as well as I do. Um, again, you can say, well, he talks a good talk, but his political party, did they live up to their ideals? Well, was the reason he, if he did, yay, why? What did he do? How can we keep this going? If he didn't, why not? What were the forces? Was it his fault? Or was it pressure put on him or put on, you know, what were the causes? To And that's how you learn and that's how you try to make your system better. Um, according to Human Rights Watch, the situation for religious minorities has significantly worsened since 2008. My goodness, think about what Human Rights Watch is saying uh, in 2024, how has, you know, the situation for religious minorities worsened since 2008? Oh, my goodness, especially in India, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar. Huh. I mean, you all probably know a lot more examples than I do. The tax on minority religious groups in Indonesia. 2007, 135, 2008, 216. In the first few months of 2011 was 184. And what is it now? You could, I could probably look it up. These kinds of attacks are also increasing in the US and around the world. We, this was not in the article, this is my comment. We are in a global cultural decline. College professors should speak out and engage in actions to address this, especially academics in the US, especially in the US, because we are, or we were, the beacon of democracy. Um, so you, I mean, the underlying view is this is anti-cultural. It's anti-intellectual in the ancient view of the intellect. It's, it's evil, ancient view of greed and pride. Every college professor everywhere should be speaking out and should not be demonizing. They should be trying to reach out to people who they, who at the, you know, without any dialogue are on a different plane or they disagree. They should reach out because it's the civilized thing to do. It's the thing to do if you want a, a sustainable future. You can't alienate people who are questioning climate change or whatever. Okay, so here's another editorial. And this is important because I'm sure there are, there are prominent intellectuals in Indonesia who self-identify as secular, some other than the official state religions, and they're alienated. And um, so they. this is a good general argument for 
a certain percentage of usually highly educated and people who would have power or could have power. Indonesia can never be a model of democracy in the sense that all citizens are equal before the law and have the right to express themselves because the philosophy upon which the nation is founded puts the belief in God as the first of its five principles. This means that the, uh, the other four principles are all conditional on the first. Okay, so my lectures point out if it means monism, then you're talking quantum physics. If it means systems thinking, then you're talking chemistry, biology, um, all uh, social science. You're really consistent with academic intellectual disciplines. If God means monotheism, which it doesn't, because it has Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism, and tribal other, then, you know, if it means monotheism, it doesn't. It, does, it doesn't mean that. So, so the, the author should at least understand that you can fill in mon, uh, monism, and that the American founders... When they said nature's God, they did not mean any traditional God. They did not mean monotheism. They meant God as the clockmaker that wound up the universe and then let it go on its own. So that, you know, America's declaration was the first, you know, official democracy, I think, um, and the declaration. And it had a view of God that you would say is monism. Um, Newton's God is not consistent with current quantum physics monism, but they definitely thought of a God that doesn't intervene in people's lives, does not intervene and you know have natural miracles changing the natural order, does not, is not a God you pray to, is not a God, right? So I, when you have an extreme position like that, if my belief deviates from the standard, I'm open to persecution. If I decide to be Jewish, pagan, agnostic, animistic, polytheistic, or just simply don't believe in wasting my time on pondering the existence of a supernatural being, I don't have a place in this country. All right. So you have to understand the author's position. And then you have to say, as an Indonesian Muslim, I want to prove that this isn't true. I want to prove it by the way I live. I want to prove it by uh, positing monism as the underlying principle by connecting it to the sciences, by positing system thinking by focusing on sustainability, by, you know, I have to do it in my way of life, in my scholarship. Um, be, and if I do that, and if Indonesian Muslims prove that this person, they give them equal rights, they don't persecute them. This is what Mr. Marif is very insistent that Muhammad said, you tolerate atheists. So Muhammad would want to tolerate. He did, Jews, right? Uh, pagans, agnostics, animists, polytheists, people who, you know, are atheists. Mari says, Muhammad says, tolerate. The, the trouble is, if you, if you do have a group of educated Indonesians that decide basically changing the, the country is necessary, you'll have instability, civil war, and probably a more authoritarian government. So I, this is where Aristotle says it's better not to change the laws too much or too radically. But so I would say you don't have to have that kind of a revolution, but you definitely do have to have this clarity about Monism is not 
monotheism. And you have to have follow-up where you do not persecute people who are not, you don't have a litmus test for what Ponticilla, what religious pluralism is. You just, you never allow any sort of worldview to be, to justify persecution or discrimination. That should be a major premise of people who try to implement, apply Ponticilla to political life. And um, Heinrich Posch, who wrote the book, The One, about the idea of unity throughout history among the theologians and philosophers, people who speculate about the original, the fun foundational principles of the universe. He said, you know, you have to be careful. And you have to realize that this does not mean authoritarianism but this actually does mean pluralism. Monism, the only consistent political system consistent with monism is pluralism, toleration, and humanism, spiritual humanism. That message has got to get out. And of course, Indonesia is going to struggle with that for its whole you know, history. I don't see how it'll ever stop struggling. It's just that the balance will tilt toward moderation and tolerance or toward intolerance and extremism and, you know, authoritarianism or democracy. We thought our country would not, that that would not happen to us. And it has happened to us. So I think the rest of American history is going to be much more of a, a tilting of a need to constantly remind ourselves, what do we really want? Right now, we really have fantasies about what authoritarianism would actually be like. Maybe we have to learn a lesson. I don't know. Maybe we'll learn our lesson. Well, for another 70 years or something, we will not fall into that again, right? We voted for Trump a second time. We had authoritarianism. People went, oh my God, I don't want that. And then it takes how many years, 30 years or whatever to get rid of it. And then people remember for another 70 years and then they'll forget. I don't know why we can't learn from history, but... We should learn from history. Historians should keep bludgeoning us by reminding us of this. You have to be an engaged citizen to preserve a free society. Do not ever forget that and do not let up um, on the activity. Okay, so this is a continuation of this editorial. Our foundation is inherently flawed and discriminatory. It influences the way we educate our children, okay? Education is critical. That's what Mr. Mari said. They're taught dogmas of their parents' religion. Mr. Mari wants the kids in the Pisandrans, the kids in the Mohammedia school, and the NU schools to, if the kids are taught dogmas and intolerance, they have to get cured of it. They have to be taught that Islam is humanistic and tolerant. They're taught to think in terms of difference rather than similarities. It takes away the spirit of universal humanity in the capacity for critical thinking and asking questions that will enable them to find answers to our common human problems. Well, okay, is that the fault of Ponchasilla? Ponchasilla itself doesn't do that. It's the fault of parents who actually are educating their children in a way that undermines Monticilla. The same thing happens in my country that the conservatives in the name of our founding fathers, in the name of patriotism, they're teaching their children dogmas. They're um, 
their thought to think in terms of difference. They take away the spirit of universal. Unbelievable. Like it's exactly the same um, in, in huge percentage of Americans. It's hard for me to tell exactly because the town that I have lived in, 80% of my students from within uh, 400 miles are taught things that are just false. And they, and you know, the way they're taught to think about liberals, progressives or pluralists or humanists, it's just not at all uh, consistent with their founders. And so in this editorial, um, it would be nice if the writer had said most, I mean, does she know this? I don't know. Is it a, just a stereotype? You could say, I'm afraid that the majority of parents in our country teach their children exactly the opposite of Panchasilla. I mean, it would be nice for her to say they teach the opposite of Panchasilla because then, okay, so the solution is to get rid of Panchasilla. You know, it would take a little bit more of an argument if she would just point out that this is not Panchasilla. She's giving you the impression that it is. Okay, she says it makes it difficult for the growth of new ideas, different ways of thinking, knowledge, scientific innovation, and philosophical inquiry. This is exactly what Thomas um, Tom Friedman was saying, right? He says, it's good that American students are given a book about the Korean. This is what makes us great. Well, there's nothing in Panchasilla that, I mean, I know that Indonesians at the UN schools are teaching Western thought and are teaching world religions. So, you know, is it really that important to get rid of Panchasilla or is it really the thing to do is to really have a curriculum where college educated Indonesians, Indonesian Muslims know, you know, they are pluralistic and they are humanistic. And then all the students in the Basandran, I don't know what percentage of Muslim, Muslims in Indonesia, their children go to Basandran, but if you have a curriculum that's moderate, like Mr. Uh, Marif wants, tolerate atheists, equality for women, uh, religious pluralism, humanism. Um, so if all the kids in the Pisandran are not, and all the kids in the secular schools are, I mean, is that really the problem to get rid of Panchasilla? Or is it really just to hold people accountable to actually be radical conservatives? It's the same with us in the US. Is the problem that we use the word freedom and it means allowing billionaires to control our country? Should we change our declaration? Or should we just make good on it that our founders cared about a middle class? They knew if you don't have a middle class, you don't have democracy. Our founders were really afraid of greed and af afraid of the centralization of wealth which should have been intuitively obvious, but because they had read Aristotle, Aristotle confirmed that. Ancient wisdom confirms their modern intuition, but they did not think. They thought science and social science, you could engineer the human psyche so that that would not be a problem. Some of them, intellectuals thought that. Um, we had blind spots. And we allowed in anti-humanist religious uh, denominations, but we insisted on separation, church and state, the secular world, citizenship, humanistic, Aristotelian humanism. Keep a line between them. And, you know, the citizens will understand that and be committed to it because they would know the religion over here is authoritarian, we'll lose our democracy. Not so, you know, Americans don't even know their own tradition. So is the problem 
Pancasila, or is the problem that Indonesians don't even know their own tradition? Um, each of my Indonesian students or colleagues will have a different view of this, and they will decide what's best to do. In the USA, the concept of freedom has been completely corrupted. It's degenerated into a free market capitalist, international capitalism. So is the solution to throw out the Declaration of Independence? Is the solution to throw out Ponchasilla? I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't think so in my case. Uh, my, you know, gut level read. I don't actually know about Indonesia. All I'm saying is if you keep it, here's what you should do. Or I don't even say that. I say, this is what Mr. Marish says, and he's respected in your country. I agree with that, you know? <laughs> so I don't know what you think. You know more than I do about Islam, Indonesia, but I really like Mr. Marish, and I really like Panchasila, but it's up to you. <laughs> Not, I can only add the Greeks and confirm it's very Greek, but it's up to you. You know the spirit of your times. It's hard to know the spirit of the times because it changes so quickly because we only know a very small percentage. We don't know what people are saying to each other in back alleys or in boardrooms or in kitchen tables. You know, how are we ever going to know that if the most toxic, the most dangerous, the most socially disrupted ideas are spoken of in private and never let out because people know if other people knew what they think, they'd be, they would try to silence them or they would be, you know, they would fight back harder. So, you know, there isn't any way to know. Um, you just give it your best shot and keep trying. That's all. Um, here's another thing that I, I really love reading applications anywhere, you know, in a Fulbright program, just to expand my imagination of all the things that our people are doing. So I'm kind I am trying to think broader and broader, but I still am in ruts. And I love reading those applications because they just blow my mind. And I imagine being, you know, this a uh, person studying this topic somewhere and that's going to be their life and they're going to make a contribution. <laughs> it just makes me happy after I read them uh, because it makes me more optimistic or it just inspires me to keep going. Um, so here's just a few. Um, the goal of this applicant is a master's in public policy and governance. And they... Um, want, you know, their life work is innovative governance. They have, they talk about the old paradigm, government as a single actor in public services. The new paradigm is governance. All possible actors are involved, non-government organizations, the private sector, corporate philanthropy and private donors, um, as well as the government. So, Governance should be participatory, collaborative, and networking, which is very consistent with Ponchasilla, especially number four. Um, and also in a systems view, the systems view is the whole is greater than some of the parts. The systems view in the social sciences, in the sciences, social science, humanities, is this kind of collaborative, cooperative, holistic approach to everything each individual organization, the relationship between the organizations, the relationships between the private NGO and government, the relationships between all of those structures at the national level and international level, the relationship between all those and the earth, right? And of course, the relation to the earth is also all the way down. So it's very consistent with systems thinking. It's a kind of systems thinking. But Panchasilla is a kind of system. Okay, community participation is also really important. This is Gotong Royong, uh, Village Uplift, local decentralized government. People know what they need. 
you can meet their needs better with a more local approach. Well, this person ought to uh, get in contact with Jarut or with his, you know, philosophy. Uh, Asset-based community development. You start with the villagers and you build university community engagement. So this uh, application, this person, if this is their career, they should get involved with university community engagement. Definitely. I mean, it's kind of disappointing they don't mention it because it means perhaps to me that the universities are cut off from government, NGOs, and corporate. The university should be mentioned as one, you know, set of one institution, one layer that's very much a part of all this stuff. Like what happened to the universities? What happened to the education? Uh, it's it's uh, not good. <laughs> that's where I come in. Um, the student, here's another one. Their goal is to clean up corruption in Indonesian government. So I did have that whole lecture. I think it's it's lecture number four or five. One of them is on Aristotle and corruption. I think it's number four. The other one is on Aristotle and terrorism. But he wants to be a worker at the Secretariat General, the People's Con Consultative Assembly of Indonesia. Um, the president wants to clean up corruption in government. Collusion, nepotism. This is again the president starting with the letter Y. Um, his goal is to get an MA in public policy studies, which in, it's interdisciplinary. Again, systems thinking, moving toward a systems paradigm, and that it is integrated with sustainable development. It includes economic, sociology, anthropology, politics and case studies. So, yeah, I mean, it was the modern enlightenment that divided all these disciplines into separate parts and with economics driving things. And it's the modern systems view that integrates all of these. And economics is a part of the broader culture. It doesn't get to drive culture. The U.S., and the irony is the U.S., they want to study in the U.S. because it has the best education and facilities and opportunities for an internship. So the U.S. does have the most public policy um, undergraduate and graduate degree programs. It also has a huge percentage of citizens that haven't even heard the two words public policy put together. They have a huge percentage that hate government which means they have no interest in public policy because public policy is a discipline because people take seriously that the government has to be involved if you're going to have a flourishing society and especially if you're going to have a middle class, which is a necessary precondition for a flourishing society. That has to be the context. So public policy is a discipline only exists because people think government is important. The majority of Americans hate government. They assume that the economic system is okay, that people can just be individuals, keep the government out of their life, work toward economic prosperity, and the consequences of that will trickle down to other people and if people just work harder, they'll become more prosperous and everybody will be happy. This is totally false. And that's why they, my students, 80% plus have never even heard those two words put together, public policy. When I was growing up, that's pretty much all we talked about at the dinner table. The civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and that was about public policy, you know. Um, so this student, when he goes back home to Indonesia, he wants bureaucracy reform. He wants to change the mindset and the culture set. Very good. The uh, better, he wants better organization, changing the pension and remuneration system, 
law enforcement, accountability and transparency in government, better policies and regulations. So it is important that the, the author understands you can't take care of these each little detail. You can't deal with law enforcement unless you look at it in this broader context. Why do we have this crime in the first place? How do we set up people so that they're desperate enough so that they commit crimes? Or how, why do we have people um, thinking, expecting that if one of their relatives gets a good job that they're expected to give the family, you know, siphon off the money for their family? Where do we get this? Uh, so it, you have to change the mindset and change the cultural set, all the norms, you know, expectations, the kind of social networks people get into, their understanding of family system. It all has to be rule for this benefit of the ruled. They have to change the different idea of justice, but back to a very fundamental idea of justice um, and culture in general is teaching people to take pleasure in generosity, self-control, creating a middle class, working together, having a higher quality of life. Um, so so um, I think this student would very much like the main themes that I'm discussing in this class. Once again, there isn't any sort of standard course that everybody takes that can be kind of foundational. The foundation under which the student has come up with these ideas. And you don't know if they just came up with that totally on their own by putting together the things they were exposed to. Or if they have some teacher somewhere who sees the big picture and is kind of mentoring them in this proposal. Hard to know. This one wants a master's of law to focus on anti-corruption law. So the previous one was to focus on corruption in government and to focus on changing mindsets and culture sets. This one is more specifically focused on the legal um, system. The U.S. Foreign Corrupt Corruption Practices Act, better oversight of that, the way, you know, having lawyers that actually look at the laws and apply the laws. Prepare for the first ever consolidated and holistic national strategy for the prevention and eradication of corruption. Very good. Did this come through? You know, did the president? <laughs> I mean, was this after the president's appointees sort of are sent to jail? Probably after they get, you know, accused of crimes. All of a sudden, okay, we need this um, uh, strategy the United Nations Convention Against Corruption can be a model for Indonesia. We need a lot of change to conform to the standards. So there is a history of uh, looking to the United Nations Conventions. So this would follow the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Indonesia, as their history, is to look to those goals, to support those goals, to work at changing things in their own country to, to conform to those goals. Why the US? Why do they want to study in the US? The top scholars, the highest quality, interaction with people from everywhere, the ultimate melting pot of people from different backgrounds and cultures. That was what I loved about my country. Again, that is being th uh, threatened, chipped away at the Republican party, is making it very difficult for college students from abroad to come in and study. They're um, questioning it, especially, of course, Chinese, but they're over, I think they're overreacting um, because it isn't just Chinese. And I mean, I read about this every day in the Chronicle of Higher Education about what's happening with international education. It is another political tool. There Certainly, there are distinctions that need to be made. 
but the Republicans have made this into a tool for political purposes, which means that they are um, performing, you know, it's a performance. They're creating this appearance. All they care about is the brand. All they care about is they can score points and get votes. It's not nuanced, it's not careful, it's just we're gonna cut programs for international students. We're gonna make it harder for them to get visas. We're not gonna let them have internships. We're not, you know, no. So overall, I don't think it pays off because it matters that we educate the best and the brightest in the developing countries, you know? <laughs> It matters that we have friends. We cannot keep bossing people around saying our way, my way or the highway, which was true right after 9-11 when um, Rumsfeld went into, the, into Europe and into these countries, said you're with us or you're against us. There's the democracies and then, yeah, this is what Rumsfeld said. There, it's obvious that we're the best and these other people are rotten. Well, now the Republican Party is saying the authoritarians, Trump honors the very people that Mr. Rumsfeld demonized. And, you know, within 24 years, a quarter of a century, that political party has completely turned upside down. So this is a lesson for Indonesians, you know, be careful, work at this all the time. It doesn't take much to turn everything upside down pretty quickly. Um, you would do it in the name of Panchasila. We do it in the name of, of freedom and democracy and rights. So be careful. Um, all right, so another one wants a master's in international affairs, international development, Indonesia's agreement on climate change to get Indonesia compliant and able to reduce emissions and be sustainable. Again, the US has more programs, I think, in sustainability, sustainable development, uh, environmental science, and we have the, more, the most deniers, and the Republican Party is cutting funding to universities, and especially funding to those sorts of programs that researchers are expected to go find funding from corporations or from the military. These are not, those organizations are not funding sustainable development at the moment. I, it might change very rapidly when we realize that our own security depends upon sustainability. Uh, climate change is undermining security. It's undermining, and then it's also undermining our capacity to compete against the Chinese economically. But at the moment, we are still stuck, except that there's plenty of programs, there's plenty of teachers. And so that's what, People, Indonesians or people from developing countries, they just look up the program. Hey, that's what I want. That's what my country wants. I want to come to the U.S. That probably after they get to the U.S., geez, Americans don't even want this. That's incredible, you know, but I'll learn it. I'll go home and I'll give it to my people. Um so Indonesia will continue to increase in the number of educated leaders and the kinds of activities they engage in. Indonesia will become more interconnected with the rest of the world, economically and politically. Hopefully more of the world's investment will come to the ASEAN nations, and those nations will be able to use that, the, that money well and to grow their economies. Indonesia also has to work on a way to preserve their natural resources to establish sustainable development practices without either their own people or foreign countries to exploit those resources without replacing them. Okay, so um, that's my short little lecture on um, Indonesia. I hope I just mostly punched some buttons, got some thinking going, got started, 
Other people can spend their whole careers on the themes in any one of these lectures. That's what scholarship does.